All right, why don't we get started? Um, good evening. Welcome to the Nature Conservancy's Perseid Meteor event, where we'll be sharing tips on the best way to view the meteor shower over the next several evenings. I'm Catherine Campbell, Associate Director of Philanthropy for the Rhode Island Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. I'm so glad you all could join us today. I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Brian Kilpatrick. We first met Brian when he was a NASA Earth and Space Science Fellow at Brown University, where he completed his PhD in physics. While he was at Brown, he presented at our Perseid Meteor Shower event and our solar eclipse event at the Nature Conservancy's Goosewing Beach Preserve in Little Compton in 2017. This is one of our most well-attended events every year, and since we cannot meet in person, we decided to bring this information to you tonight so you can enjoy the meteor shower from wherever you are. Brian is a veteran of the, US, uh, the United States Marine Corps, so Brian, thank you for your service. After Brian's military service, he completed his B BS in physics at Cutsdown University in Pennsylvania, graduating summa cum laude. Brian is currently the Exoplanet Science Prize Fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. He is currently performing research to characterize the chemistry, structure, and dynamics of transiting exoplanet atmospheres. The Space Telescope Science Institute serves as the Science Operations Center for the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Science Telescope, and supports the archives for Kepler K2 and transiting exoplanet surveying satellite. The goal of Bryant's fellowship is to allow outstanding postdoctoral researchers working on innovative scientific studies to conduct independent research in the field of exoplanetary science, leveraging the vast resources of the Institute. Brian resides in Odenton, Maryland with his wife and three children. We're very excited to have Brian back to share with us why the Perseid meteor shower is so cool. I'd like to share some housekeeping items before we begin. So everyone is, mute, is muted, um, but you can type your questions into the question box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll leave time at the end for uh, questions and answers with Brian. We anticipate that the program will be about 20 minutes, um, but Brian is doing so many cool things. We've allotted a lot of time at the end, um, so feel free to type in your questions. I've had a lot of questions just from talking with Brian, um, so I think we're gonna have a great presentation tonight. I'm going to turn off my video and pin Brian's video, um, but Brian, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so yes, I am uh, glad to be back in Rhode Island, if not in person, but virtually. Um, I had many plans to get back up to uh, get back up north and visit this summer that obviously didn't quite pan out. So this will have to do for now. Um, so thank you very much. Obviously, uh, as the uh, as Catherine mentioned, I am at home with my wife and three children. So at any moment, this could all turn into, uh, you know, the madness was the interview on CNN kind of thing. But I got a feeling that there's a lot of people out there working from home that are very understanding of <laughs> what that's like these days. Um, so let's get into it then. Uh, so the Perseid meteor shower. Uh, well, actually, I want to take a step back. And before we get into what's coming up, I want to look back briefly at something that just happened, because uh, I think it'll tie in and help us set the stage for what's going to happen here these next several evenings. Uh, and that is the Comet Neowise. Um, I'm, hoping that, I'm hoping that everyone on the call got a chance to hear about this, maybe got a chance to catch a glimpse uh, in, the, you know, in the evening sky uh, just a few weeks ago in mid-July. So this is Comet Neowise. Uh, Neowise, the name Neowise is actually just based on the, uh, the experiment or the observatory that discovered it. Wise is the, um, wide infrared survey experiment and NEO is because it was it served its mission and then it was kind of repurposed and and given a new mission which was to scan the solar system for things like things like uh, asteroids and comets and the like and so um, several months ago this program NEOWISE discovered this particular comet which is really 
has a has a has some address bar on it. It's 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 Neo Eyes C twenty twenty F three or something, right? So, but we just call it Neo Eyes for short, since it's the one that ended up uh, making a nice close approach and gave us a chance to see it with the naked eye. So Neo Eyes. So we we all got to hear a little bit about comets over the last month or so, just to kind of review what are they? They're just these giant balls of ice and dust, really. Uh, we call them dirty snowballs. They're about half ice, half dust. And by ice, you know, it's, a low, it's water ice, it's methane ice, and maybe some other, you know, some other uh, compounds that are in there, but it's just ice and then dust. And by dust, we're talking just small particles. Um, and, and so what happens is, you know, so they're on these very long period, highly elliptical orbits. Now, what do I mean by elliptical? Um, so we think of the planets in the solar system as being very circular orbits. Now, if you take that and kind of stretch it out into a more oval shape, that's what we mean by an elliptical orbit. And these elliptical orbits uh, for these comets are usually aligned such that the sun, they, you know, they, they approach very close to the sun at one end of that oval and then, uh, and then go back very, very, very far away from the sun and spend most of their time out there. Um, kind of the laws of orbital mechanics say that, uh, you know, when you are kind of at this point of, of periaps where you're very close to the sun, these comets move much faster and are kind of slingshotted back out and move much slower when they're further away. So they spend most of their time out very, very far away from the sun, where it's nice and cold and the ices are very comfortable and they can just live their lives in, in peace and harmony. Uh, however, when they start getting close to the sun, they start heating up, those ices melt, the, the, those ices melt, that dust is freed, and what you see is there, you know, this, this kind of trail of gas and dust uh, behind them as they streak closer and closer to the sun. As I said, eventually they complete their, you know, this end of their elliptical orbit and make their way back out into the far reaches of the outer solar system. For something like NEOIs, uh, the period of NEOIs is estimated to be about 6,700 years. So uh, we're, you and I are not likely to have another sighting of this particular comet. Um, and the closest approach just it was 64 million miles uh, to give you a sense of scale of what 64 million miles means. Let's say that the earth is approximately 90 million miles from the sun. So we're talking about, you know, it, it, something like two thirds of a, two thirds of an earth uh, of an Earth's orbital radius is how close this particular comet got to the sun. Okay, so that's NEOIs. We all got to see a comet and, and get it fresh in our minds and in the news streams over the last month. Um, and I mentioned that it spends most of its time way in the far outer reaches of the solar system. I wanna take a second and explain what I mean exactly by the way far outer reaches. I'm talking about something that's called the Oort cloud. And the Oort cloud is a spherical shell, if you will. It's not really a shell because it's not a thin surface, right? It's this, this, it's this sphere. It's kind of a solid sphere that is filled with these types of objects, these smallish objects. I say smallish because we're talking about things typically smaller than planet size. I mean, things that are sizes of, you know, mountains to, you know, and smaller up to sizes of continents kind of floating around, again, fragments of ice, dust, and those types of things uh, surrounding in this giant sphere, surrounding and enveloping our solar system. And I put this graphic up because I want you to understand that the entire solar system, uh, which, which is here in this box, fits in that little tiny blue box in the center there of the Oort cloud. So I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to use this term AU. When I talk about an AU, the AU is what the average orbital, orbital distance is of the Earth to the Sun. That 90 million miles or so that I threw out earlier. So the Earth orbits at one AU. So something like Pluto orbits at about 40 AU. That's an average because it, it doesn't have a perfectly circular orbit. Well, just for a round number, we'll say Pluto is about 40 AU. I'm not taking any Pluto as a planet or not questions, by the way. No, <laughs> um, no actually I will, because we'll see some evidence as to, uh, as to whether it should or shouldn't be later on, I think. Anyhow, um, Pluto is about 40 AU. Well, this Oort cloud extends out to a couple thousand AU. So again, 50 times 
the size of what we tend to think of as the solar system. Really, if you include this Oort cloud as part of the solar system, it's 50 times larger than what we typically think of. Uh, as I mentioned before, it is spherical, whereas the, well, these parts of the solar system, again, the planetary orbits, the Kuiper belt, the Astro belt, are all very flat and disk-like. Uh, this is not flat, it is spherical. And so this part, the, the planetary part of the solar system and the stellar part of the solar system uh, kind of all went into this during the star formation processes as all of the gas and dust was gravitationally collapsing. Uh, it kind of starts to spin up. Uh, conservation of angular momentum means that as this all kind of comes together, there's kind of one piece of angular momentum that you know outwinds them all and, and so you end up with things collapsing down into this kind of pancake shape whereas these things much much further away did not get necessarily sucked in during that gravitational collapse during stellar formation or, and uh, and so remain more scattered and spherical and so there really could be some really interesting science out here because this could be stuff that never got if it never got involved in that stellar formation process it would be representative of what the of the gas envelope was like prior to star formations or prior to things heating up and a lot of chemistry happening. These, uh, these things out here may have evidence as to what was floating around in the universe before stellar formation even happened. So some interesting stuff there. Uh, so that's why you know comets can be kind of an interesting part of science. So you've got all this stuff floating around right here. Right? I have some facts over here and over, over on the left side, right? There's billions and trillions of them. Um, so how do these things end up coming and, you know, coming and making these, these high speed passes, uh, past the sun? Why don't they just keep floating out here? Well, you know, they can be, uh, they can be kind of destabilized gravitationally, um, by another object. Um, could some of these things have, you know, some of the things could have started out in the Kuiper belt or asteroid belt and been, uh, gravitationally, uh, made gravitationally unstable by you know, a passing planet or, or another object. And so you have all these things out here, they get disturbed, they're, you know, they're in some orbit, maybe that orbit is disturbed and they get some gravitational kick that sends them flying in towards the sun. You know, many of them, I'm sure you have gravitational kicks flying away and we never see them again. And so uh, as they interact out here, uh, occasionally you'll get ones that, that will get kicked in towards the sun. And if they are kind of kicked in at the right speed and right angle, they might have be on a stable orbit that continues to happen over and over again, uh, which is what we're going to see with the next comet that we talk about. Before moving on to the next comet, we're going to talk about just uh, this is a this is just a graphic here, not a, not a live shot, but I was. Um, oh, I I forgot to mention. Let me go back one second. You know, when I was talking about NeoEyes earlier, I wanted to highlight uh, this photo that I chose to use for for NeoEyes is a photo that was taken by uh, Bob Horton, who uh, is a friend of mine who was on the staff at Brown, runs astronomy labs there, uh, has, some, has some responsibilities with the lab observatory, uh, but is among all of those things, a, an avid amateur astronomer, an avid uh, amateur uh, astrophotographer. And so he takes some great pictures that I absolutely love seeing him post. And so I wanted to, uh, when choosing uh, an image for NeoEyes here, make sure that I highlighted something that, that Bob took that was, you know, just done uh, right there in, in Foster, uh, Rhode Island. So, Bob, thanks for the supplying the images here. Okay, so, you know, I'm using this kind of, this image here, just so we can kind of see this representation of what the tail of the comet looks like. And the fact that you see two components to it. Uh, there is the uh, there is the, the brighter kind of white region here, which we call the dust tail, and there's kind of fainter tail here that we call the gas tail. Now really what you would think naively, right, would be that the comet is streaking across the sky and the tail is just the, the dust that it's left in its wake. So the tail just kind of extends directly behind the comet opposite its direction of travel. And it turns out that's really not the case at all. Uh, these dust particles and the dust tail that are freed yeah, they kind of do start out as, as you know, just kind of directly tracing um, the path of the comet. However, they're actually sensitive to the radiation pressure of sunlight. So photons from the sun hitting these dust particles, actually, you have to think about the, 
these rays of sun, the photons of sun, is actually bumping into the dust particles, actually imparting some small amount of momentum to them so that the sunlight actually pushes them. And so the dust tail gets kind of pushed so that it starts to go into the direction pointing away from the sun more so than away from the direction that the comet is traveling. And so that's why this dust tail is often kind of an arc because you have this process where, you know, dust that's, that's been left there longer has been interacting with these photons longer, has been pushed further. So you have this kind of this arcing dust tail that tends to point kind of away from the direction of the sun. And the gas tail, uh, the gas here is heated up ionized gas and ion ions interact very strongly with magnetic fields. And so the gas tail actually lines up with the magnetic field lines from the sun, which typically to, you know, to, to first order point directly away from the sun. So this gas tail should always point you directly at the sun. And so in this graphic, yeah, maybe the sun's over here, so it's not quite perfect, but right. So this, this tail should point you directly towards the sun. And this dust tail is some combination of the, the path of the, the comet uh, with that stellar pressure from the sun. So that's why you have two tails. You have the gas and the dust that have been melted away, uh, reacting differently to you know, solar pressure or magnetic forces. All right, so we talked a lot about neo eyes there, a little bit of what comets are, where they're coming from. Why comets? I thought we were talking about a meteor shower. Well, that's because all of the particles that are gonna hit our atmosphere and make this beautiful light show are the remnants of a comet called the Swift-Tuttle Comet. Uh, Swift-Tuttle is the name of the two people who discovered this comet uh, back in its previous, not, not the most recent, but the previous pass, which was in the 1860s. Um, you know, we don't, we don't usually uh, get things, astronomers don't get things named after us the way that they used to. I don't think there'll ever be a planet that I discover called, you know, Kilpatrick, whatever. Um, they're typically named after the observatories and the telescopes now, uh, so they have much more boring names. So I guess my chance for, for never ending fame via a named planet is probably past. But anyway, um, so Swift Tuttle, it's the maker of the Perseids. It's a comet that has a 133 year orbit. So this is on a significantly different type of orbit or at least size of orbit as, uh, as Neowise, right? That was 6,700 years orbit. This is only 133 year orbit. It's about 16 miles in diameter. Uh, it, it last showed up in 1992. I'll come back to that. Uh, so this aphelion and perihelion numbers I have here, again, we're going back to AU. So an AU is the average distance uh, from the sun to the earth. So it's kind of furthest point away is only 50 AU. Remember we said Pluto was something like 40, right? So this is only about 50 AU uh, away at its further, furthest point. Whereas something like Neowise was, you know, again, way out there in the Oort cloud at, you know, thousands of AU away. So big difference there in scale. Um, and, at, and at its closest, it's at about 0 0.96. AU from the sun. So, so it kind of coincides. Well, 0.96, that's really, really close to one. Uh, so it, it kind of comes in and uh, its closest approach to the sun is kind of really very, very close to the Earth's orbit around the sun, which we will see in just a minute. Uh, so it's speed near perihelion. Remember I said that, you know, these, uh, these comets have different speeds depending on where they are in their orbit. And when it's closest to the sun, it's kind of where it's at its fastest. It'll be about 46 kilometers a second. So it's, it's moving. It's moving. Um, so I said the la it was last seen in 1992. So then you can say, all right, you know, you can kind of work backwards from there. So the, the, the time that it was seen before that was you know, in roughly 1860, right? And uh, I, I'd like to think that record keeping, time keeping, and our ability to work out the or these kind of orbital mechanics has vastly improved over the last 130 years or so. Um, but so when this, when, when Swift Tuttle made its last pass in 92, uh, it was late, it was about 12 days late, as I recall. And 
that got people really worried that they didn't quite have the orbital properties quite perfect. And there was one uh, scientist who did all the calculations and said, boy, if this is the case, if this is going to be another 15 days late, the next time it comes around, um, you know, and the, uh, we could, you know, we could be in a lot of trouble here. I actually think it's going to collide with Earth. Uh, so there was quite a scramble, quite a worry for a while, but they were able to keep looking back further and further back in history and find more and more instances of this comet being observed uh, to really hone in and, and get much more precise constraints on the, uh, on the period. And now they think that we're safe for at least another couple thousand years. So we got that going for us, you know, 2020 at least. This, this is one thing I'm gonna take off of the plate for 2020, I think. I think we're well, safe. Thank so. you so much, Brian. Yeah, that's, that's a really... Uh, <laughs> There's not much I'm willing to, to, to go out on a limb on and say, this isn't going to happen in 2020, the way things have gone, but it's not going to be a swift tunnel. All right. Great. Thanks. Great. Um, but, you know, so this is really interesting, you know, in all kinds of astronomical events where you can go back through the record and, you know, you can go back to times of, you know, kind of biblical times or, or even in BC times. And you can find, there's obviously not going to be scientific journals that, memorialize these things in the way that we would think of now, but you can go and, and just, and you, you can find just descriptions of these things that were, and a lot of times they're attributed to maybe, you know, uh, supernatural or, or religious phenomena. And so in some of these texts from ancient religions, you can find descriptions of events and, uh, and we can kind of do the math and figure out, oh my gosh, that was a supernovae event that happened uh, thousands of years ago. And so we're able to use that information um, that, you know, where people may not have understood what they were seeing thousands of years ago, we now know by reading those texts, ah, this is, this is probably what that was, and we can use that information now to, to help us make further predictions. All right, getting into some of the nitty gritty here. All right, so Swift Tuttle came 1992. It came in 1860. It came every 133 years, kind of on the, as scheduled, uh, leading up to that. Its path through our solar system. Now, it, it, it's kind of, so I wanna point out here that it's kind of inclined, right? This, this is flat and this is up at an angle. So it's not on the same plane as the rest of the orbits of the planets. It's kind of comes in from a steep elevation. Uh, so when you see this graphic here, you have to understand that that's, th this looks much more flat, but understand that this is coming from a steep elevation. So the comet Swift Tuttle sweeps in and it kind of crosses over this part of Earth's orbit here and then makes its way back up and out of the solar system. So this is doing this every 133 years and it's leaving behind it in its wake, this you know, scattering of gas and dust. And you know, of course that dust will start to diffuse and you know, radiation pressure will start to push it away and it'll get thinner and thinner and then 133 years later, the comet comes back and replenishes it. So we kind of have this steady supply of gas and dust out here right along this particular path. Or so the dust, right? The dust is what we're really talking about. So Earth's orbit, fairly stable. It's a, again, to kind of zero the order, right? We don't need to talk about how the Earth's orbit is changing as time goes by. For the most part, it's pretty stable. And so every year, right around this time, say 11th, 12th, 13th of August, uh, the Earth kind of plows right through this dust trail as it's orbiting the sun. And so as it plows through this dust trail, the Earth, by the way, is moving at like, do I, do I have this on the next slide? No, no. The Earth, as it's moving in its orbit, is moving at like 60,000 miles per hour, okay? So the Earth is, it's, we don't think of the Earth as moving very, very fast, but it, because of our reference frame, but it is, it's moving 60,000 miles per hour through space and boom, it runs into this dust that's kind of floating around and bouncing around and scattering around out there that may have its own, <clears throat> its own velocity. And so what we're seeing is as the Earth runs into this dust, it's hitting the atmosphere. As the dust enters the atmosphere, uh, it's getting very hot and burning up. So I, again, I'll go back to something that happened just recently. <clears throat> Excuse me, one second. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we had Doug and Bob come back in the SpaceX Dragon capsule uh, just a week or so ago. And for those of you 
for those of you my age or, or older, you know, we have, I'm sure, a lot of memories of spacecraft and re-entry um, into the, you know, into the atmosphere and how scary and crazy that is with, you know, the, the heat shields and, uh, you know, flames engulfing the spacecraft as it, as it, as it re-enters the atmosphere. So think of these dust particles as undergoing a similar process, right? These dust particles are hitting the atmosphere. They're going incredibly fast. Uh, the air that they're trying to push on the way, you know, is going, is, is, is heating up, expanding and ionizing and going supersonic and creating these huge flashes of light. And sometimes supersonic is really producing booms as, as well. Um, so that's what, you know, that, that's what's happening here is Earth is slamming into this, this dust trail. Uh, what I want to show down here in this bottom right is that when is the best time to do this? Well, the Earth is moving in this direction. Uh, it's also spinning around its axis. So we're looking like down at the North Pole here, really. And the Earth is spinning around on its axis. And so this is evening. If you were, so if you're here facing the sun, that's noon. And as the Earth spins, you get to this point. That's about sunset, so that's evening. Face, you're on the opposite side of the sun looking out, that's midnight, right? And then you get back to here and this is morning. Well, if the earth is moving in this direction from left to right, as my bottom right figure shows, okay, it's not likely to slam into things that are chasing it, okay? There will be some, some particles, some dust particles that still enter the atmosphere, uh, kind of catching up to it because of their own velocity. But really, if the earth is plowing into something, you're going to see it on that face that's facing the direction that Earth is moving. Okay, so Earth is orbiting around this way, so it's moving in this direction. So you want to be on this side of the Earth so that you can look straight up and you're looking right out to where all these events are happening. So this tells us that sometime closer to morning rather than closer to sunset, you know, closer to sunrise than sunset is going to be the best time uh, to view an event like this. Now, this figure over here, as crazy as it looks, is just to kind of give you the answer of why are they called the Perseids? Well, if the Earth is moving in this direction around the sun, and most of the, the events are going to happen here at this kind of leading edge, then when you look out from the Earth at these events, the background on the celestial sphere, and the celestial sphere it's just if we took all the stars on the sky and just painted them on a big clear beach ball and surrounded the solar system, right? That's, this is how we get the constellations. We see these patterns in the stars. So pretend, you know, we just paint the, paint the stars on this giant clear ball surrounding the solar system. When we look out at where these events are coming from, our background is going to be some set of constellations. It just so happens that this constellation that is our backdrop for this event, is Perseus. So this is why we call them the Perseids, because they appear to come out of the constellation Perseus. Now this is Perseus. Perseus was a, was a son of Zeus, uh, decapitated the Medusa, so you know you can imagine this, this is Perseus and he's got his, you know, his sword here and he's holding up Medusa there. And um, so anyway, this is, so, so there's this point just above Perseus that they call the radiant. And this is the point at which all of these meteors will appear to come from. So any meteor that you see, you may not see it in Perseus. You may see it way, you know, over here. But if you were to trace the tail back, they all kind of tend to point towards this one spot called the radiant uh, in Perseus. So there's where the name comes from. Uh, this is, you know, looking, it says it's looking northeast at about 11 p.m., okay? And uh, so that's just a, kind of a, an idea if you're going to stay up a little bit late and want to look for it, you can find something like Cassiopeia is very high in the sky, usually easily recognizable, that kind of W shape of Cassiopeia. Uh, if you go out to the night sky, find Cassiopeia, uh, again, looking kind of northeast and very high in the sky and then kind of work your way down from there. Uh, that's kind of the area that you want to look in. And they say, you know, don't just, you don't have to just stare right at Perseus, kind of look a little bit to, to, to either side and, uh, and, and you'll start to see, hopefully start to see some if we have good clear weather and a, and a good event. Now, admittedly, keeping up with the weather has not been one of the things I've been very good at over the last uh, couple of months because it's become so irrelevant in my daily routine, it seems, since I 
uh, you know, since working from home and being stuck inside so much. But, um, you know, I think that if the weather there in Rhode Island is anything like it is down here in Maryland, which it usually is, uh, you know, it's going to be partially, you know, partly cloudy, partly clear. It's going to be hit or miss here and there. But if you, you know, hopefully there'll be more times of clear than cloudy where you can get out and find a good spot to, to grab a seat and, um, and gaze for a while. So just to go back, I think I've touched on this, but I just want to be really clear, like what are we actually seeing when we see these streaks of light across the sky? Uh, these are those dust particles that we talked about. Again, they're very small. These are millimeter size objects. These are not big things. These are not big, huge rocks. These are little tiny particles of dust. They hit the atmosphere, you know, at something like 100,000 miles per hour. They heat up, ionize the air. Okay, and these typically burn up very high in the atmosphere. They're very short-lived events. Uh, you know, they're you know, fractions of a second or a second long. They burn up high in the atmosphere. These things are very small, so they're not likely to make it all the way to the ground. So we don't need to worry about any, hopefully need, we don't need to worry about any impacts from anything like this. But it is 2020, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so to kind of wrap this, start to wrap this up. Um, so if we've inspired you to go out and take a look at the sky tonight, I can't promise anything from meteor showers, right? There, you know, there's, um, you know, if we have good clear weather and dark skies and, you know, you can get, you can get uh, times where you have, you know, several per minute, you know, several of these per minute coming down and it's a great show. Other times it may be, you know, you know, far fewer. Um, and if the weather stinks, then, you know, you might just be out of luck altogether. But what I can tell you is that if you're out there waiting for this thing, uh, there's some other stuff that you can take a peek at to pass the time that I think is really cool and really interesting stuff. Um, we're in a great spot right now. So this is what I'm showing in this image. This is where all of the planets are in their orbit right now today. And so here, again, this, so imagine this is, uh, this is the evening Terminator at sunset. And uh, this is where you would be at sunrise. And so at sunset, okay, or shortly after sunset, you're going to have Jupiter and Saturn high in the sky. Uh, Jupiter will be incredibly bright. It, it should stand out. You will look up. You will look up just after sunset and you'll say, wow, that star is really, really bright. And you'll say, wait, that's not a star. Brian said, that's Jupiter. Uh, and then you'll be able to, you should be able to find Saturn, not quite as bright, but also a very bright object to the sky will be very close to Jupiter in the sky. Um, if you have a small telescope or if you have even a set of binoculars sometimes, that's enough to be able to see the moons of Jupiter. And definitely with a, I don't, with Saturn, with a small telescope, uh, you can usually distinguish the rings of Saturn. And so if you have that uh, and you get some clear, clear weather over the next couple of nights, good time for just after sunset to do some viewing there. Now let's switch to the morning. Uh, so in the morning, you know, you may be able to pick up Mars here, you know, be kind of close to the moon. Um, but I mentioned the morning more so because of the moon than, than Mars. <clears throat> As I said, you know, closer to sunset rather than closer to sun, or I'm sorry, closer to sunrise is better for viewing the Perseids. Unfortunately, the moon is kind of right here in that similar part of the sky where we wanna look. Uh, it's not, it, it's not gonna completely drown everything out, but, um, but it will be close and so, you'll wanna, if you want the best chance at having the darkest sky, you'll want to view uh, you know, slightly after midnight, kind of before the moon rises to get the darkest sky to get a look at the Perseids. Because uh, the moon, once it rises, will give you some kind of, you know, light pollution there and make it a little bit tougher to see. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. So that's the Perseids. I hope that I've given you enough to understand what you're looking at if you get a good chance to go out there and see them. And uh, let me know. We'll check the chat and let me know if you have any questions. All right. Uh, let me just, thank you, Brian. We do have some questions. So let me, um, so the first question that we have is how do we know the Oort cloud exists and what is beyond it? 
Uh, okay, it's a great question. Um, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't actually guess I didn't really go over this explicitly. It was written in the notes there, but right. So the org cloud is 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 theoretical. We don't have the technical ability to, you know, a, a telescope with the resolution to actually image these objects, actually see them. But it's a very widely accepted concept uh, because it kind of perfectly explains what we do observe in terms of these long period comets. Um, so with, you know, it, it's one of those things where without it, you really struggle to come up with a reasonable explanation of where these comets are coming from. They can, because the other option is that they are interstellar objects that are kind of wandering through, you know, through space from star to star, but we see them show up periodically. So they have to be existing out there. And, it, and, and so if, when you kind of put all of those things together, um, it tends to make sense. Uh, I also, I think I failed to mention that, you know, the size of this thing relative to the solar system, I talked a lot about. What I didn't mention that was written on the slides was that this thing extends uh, nearly halfway, you know, to the next closest star. Um, so, you know, the Oort cloud takes up a huge amount of space. Uh, what comes after that? After that, you get what's called the, uh, the interstellar medium. And so it's not populated with the, not thought to be populated with these with these larger icy objects. So it would be more of what we think of as we, you know, we tend to simplify space right, and think of it as this vacuum, which it's not truly a vacuum. Right? We, the, the, there's, there's gas in the interstellar medium, um, there's, you know, floating around. And so, uh, and so that, that's really what you get past the Oort cloud. And don't think of the Oort cloud as being something that's really dense either. You know, images like that make it seem like you couldn't take two steps in the Oort cloud without running into another object. That's really not the case uh, for, if we put up graphics to try to demonstrate what it is that were really to scale, they would look like absolutely nothing. So the Oort cloud is still very, uh, not densely populated. There are a lot of objects, but think about the size of it. You know, when you're talking about something that's that large to fit trillions of objects in it, they're still really, really, really far apart. Um, so yeah, so you have the Oort cloud, where you have some of these icy comedy things hanging out. Then you get past that and you have the interstellar medium, which is just a uh, you know, kind of primordial gas, you know, hydrogen, helium, and type things like that floating around. Great, uh, another Oort question, and you might have answered part of this, what sets the limit of the 2000 AU size of the Oort cloud? Um, why doesn't it, it continue out to infinity? Ah, good question. So, um, so let me preface this with I am not an Oort cloud expert, but um, you can look at the distribution of the periodicity of objects that we see, right? You, you know what the objects are that we see that we, that we assume come from this Oort cloud. And so based on their periods and the shapes of their orbits, you can figure out where, how far out they're, they're coming from. And so that will give you a sense of what the actual shape is. So there's a cutoff where we don't see, we don't see objects, we don't see objects uh, orbiting at these much longer periods that would suggest much further orbits. And we can also look at kind of the, the gravity field, right? We can say what, what range would these things be gravitationally bound? If you get far, far enough out, uh, these comets would no longer be gravitationally bound and they would just continue through the interstellar medium until they interacted with something else. And so that's, that's kind of what sets the size as you can see the sample of objects that we observe uh, and think about um, and simulate, you can do a lot of simulations where you can simulate orbits and figure out what would be gravitationally stable and what, would, what wouldn't be. Great. Um, is a typical shooting star if a typical shooting star is one millimeter, how large are the fireball meteorites? Yeah, yeah, good question, right? So this is just one thing. Uh, so I, I talked about these being, you know, dust particles, trail of a comet. Uh, we have, so there's also something called the asteroid belt, right? Which is, um, you know, kind of just out, just outside of the, the gas giants, uh, which are full of, instead of gas particles or ice things are full of just chunks of rock that are left over from, from planetary formation. And so those things can often also be, um, you know, through gravitational interactions can be kicked out and, and sent on crazy orbits and crazy directions. Uh, and so you can have those pieces of rock meteors, which 
will sometimes hit the ground and turn into meteorites. That can be, you know, any number of sizes. So, um, you know, the ones I, so, it, you know, it's sometimes hard to tell because by the time they reach the ground, they've burned off a lot, but you know, the, but those things can be, you know, the size of, you know, giant boulders hitting the top of the atmosphere. And, you know, you might have a soccer ball that impacts uh, the ground. And when you have something like that, it's a major, you know, that, that I'm referencing the, the one from, uh, from, from Russia from just a few years ago, you know, that uh, I hope maybe some people have seen the, the YouTube videos of, and, you know, just something like that side, and that's a major explosion in the sky. That's pretty, pretty impressive to watch. So, so yes, these meteors from this meteor shower, millimeter size stuff, very different from when you have uh, these kind of rocky, you know, part particles from, from asteroids that, that impact the atmosphere, different, different thing. All right. Um, let's see. How many habitable planets are located within four to five light years? One. <laughs> <laughs> it's at distance zero. Um, <laughs> okay, so, well, that's a tough question because, so four to five light years, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head, Proxima Centauri, the closest star to us, is four or so light years away, which would mean that 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 the, the answer would be, you know, that there couldn't be more because just because this that constraint of distance is, is too small. But I'll answer the question a little bit more broadly. Um, what we know is there's we what we know is there's lots of planets out there. Uh, we are at the very, very early stages of really understanding what this huge sample of planets we have are like. Um, we don't have the ability right now to directly go out there and find Earth 2.0, like a, you know, well, an Earth-sized planet at, Earth's, at the Earth-sized distance from the sun around a sun-like star. We're not, we're not quite there yet where we can just go and point a telescope at a star and say, look, there's another planet that's just like Earth. And so I will say there are lots of planets out there that we've discovered. And so there are lots of planets that could possibly be habitable. Um, but we are, will over the next several decades really make the biggest gains in answering if they are or are not. You know, so we have a bunch of candidates uh, at, at this point, I wouldn't say that we have found anything that is habitable because we're just not there, not there yet. Okay, great. Um, you're an astronomer, astronomer, but you're doing a talk for the Nature Conservancy. What is your view of the connection between skyscape and landscape in terms of conservation and in, uh, environmental ethics? Hmm. Um, I, I view the sky as for everyone. Um, and so, uh, and so things that impact the ability of everyone to use the sky for whatever purposes, uh, whether it's for scientific research, whether it's for, uh, amateur viewing, you know, for, for your personal enjoyment. Um, I, I am, I don't want to say I am against, but I think that any, you know, but that those things need to be considered very, very much just as, so I think I would, I treat the sky and I treat, you know, or earth orbit, I think should be treated the way that we treat our, our terrestrial environment. And that uh, decisions that are made that are, you know, quote, you know, business decisions uh, need to consider the preservation of this great resource of this great thing for, you know, for humankind. And so, um, for those of you, you know, for whoever asked that question, you know, you, you're probably, you know, if, if you're hearing, if you're hearing me, you know, hint towards constellations of satellites that are very problematic. Uh, yes, that's what I'm hinting at. So, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, you know, you know, I, I feel like, uh, yes, that, much like preserved areas of Earth, uh, you know, we should think of Earth orbit as a preservation area uh, that we should be very, very careful with how we use it. 
great. Was the Perseid shower denser right after the Swift Tuttle passed in 1992 than before, or is it spread along the orbit evenly? So I, I think I understood the first part of the question. I'm not sure. Um, so I'll do my, so, so, so I actually, I, I actually don't know this for sure. I, I, I did not check into this, but presumably, yes, right? Presumably the Perseid meteor shower of 1993 would have been more intense than the Perseid meteor shower of 1991. So I would, I, I am, I don't know that for a, to be a fact, but I would suspect that that is the case. All right. What is the status of policy interventions to limit light pollution? Anything we can do as citizens to support this? Well, sure. Um, you know, it just takes, so, so I think there are a lot of people that make these decisions that just aren't even aware that it's an issue. They aren't even aware that it's a problem. And so it just takes someone to, to speak up and someone to be an advocate uh, because there are ways around it. Um, you know, when I was an undergraduate at Kutztown University, there was a project where they were redoing, redoing all of the parking lots because there wasn't enough student parking. You know, go figure, right? A college campus with not enough student parking. Um, so they had this huge, this, this huge project to build new parking lots, and and part of that project was, of course, doing the lighting for for those. And and we got a, you know, there was a small group that that got together, led by one of the faculty, one of the astronomy faculty there, that said, "Hey, if you do this, could you just use lights that you know point down and not just point out in all directions?" And then you know, kind of helped them through some options. And the universe is like, "Oh well, okay, fine. This doesn't really cost us any more money." So sure, why not? So I think, you know, we need people. And again, this is another definite kind of, kind of uh, similarity with the Nature Conservancy is that you need people that are gonna be advocates because the people that are in charge of making these decisions and designing projects, building projects, um, you know, city managers, these sorts of things, they, they've never thought of this problem and they, they don't even know that it's a problem if we don't go and advocate and, and, and show them that there are other solutions uh, that you know probably are economically feasible, if not you know economically cost-saving, if they just take the time to do it. Um, and then finally, um, you focus your study on exoplanets. Can you explain what that is? Uh, um, if only I'd had something prepared. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so if you're interested in exoplanets and what I do, I'll, I'll just run you through the quick kind of five minute version of, um, of what exoplanets are and, and, and what, where we are. Cause you know, somebody asked a question of about habitable planets and earth-like planets and that type of thing. So I'll touch on a little bit of that here real quick, but so what are exoplanets? By exo, we just mean planets around other stars. So it's every planet that's not orbiting the sun. Do they exist? Yes, we have discovered thousands of them. Uh, how do we find them? I'll show you real quick what we're doing to find them. Um, and, and given that we don't actually have the technology to quote, you know, see them, right? We, we don't have a telescope where we can point it at the sky and say, look, there's another planet. That's mostly true. We actually, we can image some planets, but 99% of planets, especially the ones that we're most interested in, we cannot just see them. So we have to figure out that they're there and learn about them without actually being able to see them. And that's kind of tricky. Um, but that's the fun of what I do. Uh, let's see. So the way that we find a lot of them is through the transit method, where basically, if a planet happens to be kind of on, if the orbit of the planet is on the right plane, the right geometry, such that as it's orbiting its star, if we get this edge on look, and the planet happens to eclipse or transit its star, it blocks some fraction of the starlight. And we are, we do have instruments that are sensitive enough to measure that little tiny dip in the starlight because of the planet blocking some of it. Uh, and so, you know, up to, you know, we can, we can do this to like fractions of a percent. We have instruments that are sensitive enough to do this. So if you stare at a star and you keep seeing that dip over and over again on a regular period, uh, you can infer then that there must be a planet there in orbit around that star that, that's causing that effect. 
Uh, the other thing that we do is we use something called the radial velocity method. So as a planet orbits the star, the planet, the, the star isn't actually stable. It's not actually just sitting there. The, the two are kind of gravitationally interacting with each other. They both orbit around the center of mass of the system. Typically, that center of the mass of the system is well, well with inside the star. So it's not like you really, so in a way we say, well, we don't see the star moving. You're right, but it is just very, very small amounts, but it is moving. It is kind of jiggling around its center as the planet orbits around it. And so this is an exaggerated example, um, but what we can do with this is we can use the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is, you know, light waves, or sound waves get kind of compressed or stretched out if an object is moving towards or away from you. This is the train horn effect, right? If a train's coming at you, you hear the pitch of the train get higher and higher, and then it drones out as it goes away. Well, we can see the molecular and atomic features that are present in this star get Doppler shifted back and forth as it wobbles around the center of mass due to the planet's orbit. And again, if we see this shifting back and forth on this regular periodic basis, we can say that there's a planet there that's making that happen. So the red is radial velocity, the green is transits, and these are all the planets that we found. And yeah. look, like this is just now happening. This is so brand new. Um, as of 2010, we had a couple hundred planets discovered. In 2020, we're up to 4,000. So this is really just a, a blossoming field. Uh, it's brand new, it's exciting. We're finding lots of interesting things. And so when, again, when asked about habitable planets, we're so in the beginning of this, we have so far to go. But you know, if this was, if this was the, the last decade, I can't wait to see what the next couple of decades bring in this research. Um, just to, this is just kind of the mass and period. And I, I just show this quickly to say, the things we find, these are the solar system planets here, the things we find are usually very big because we need to measure that dip, that, that uh, the amount of light the planet blocks. So big planets block more light, so they're easier to find. Uh, and things that are short periods. So this is the period here. This is one day to, to 100 days. So a lot, all of this stuff in this, in this area are things that are on you know, a few days orbit. So they're very, very close to their stars. I mean, they're probably very, very hot. So big things, close period things. Um, big things are also easy to find with radio velocity. They, they tug on the star more. So that's why you have a lot of big things here in radio velocity and a lot of big things here in transit as well. Um, but we're going to keep pushing down into this area to discover more Earth-like and solar system-like planets. Uh, but what we have found so far, the planets we have found are really interesting in that these brackets up top show you the, the sizes of the planets in our solar system. And these histograms show you the size of the planets we found. The most popular size of planet in the entire galaxy, as far as we know at this point, we don't even have it in our solar system. So like our solar system is weird. It doesn't have the most popular kind of planet. It doesn't have those Jupiters. These are Jupiter sized planets on two day orbits. A Jupiter sized planet on a two day orbit. We don't have that. So our solar system is not like what we're finding and which is really interesting. So it brings up a lot of questions about how planets are formed. Why did our solar system turn out this way instead of another way? And so there's a lot, uh, a lot going on in there. A lot of information we're getting from these planetary statistics about that stuff. Um, what I do specifically is I actually take it to the next step. And once we find planets, I try to figure out like what they're made of, what their atmospheres are like, that kind of stuff. So imagine when this planet's passing in front of the star during that transit, what if it has an atmosphere? It has an atmosphere, then some of the starlight actually gets like filtered through this atmosphere. And so certain molecules in the atmosphere might absorb some of that starlight and it'll make the planet seem bigger than what it really is. So if we can look at how deep this transit is uh, as a function of specific wavelengths, we can actually detect molecules in a planetary atmosphere. Same thing happens when a planet goes behind the star. The planet is, if it's a warm planet, it's radiating heat. But when it goes behind the star, we lose the part of the signal uh, that the planet is contributing. We only have the heat from the star itself. So when this goes away, whatever that fraction is that's missing, that tells you what the temperature of the planet is. And then if we watch it during its whole orbit, so these, like these Jupiters I talked about that are on two-day orbits, uh, they go through something called tidal locking. And it means that they kind of get stretched and, and, and pulled and such that uh, because they're so close to the star, the gravitational 
field that's really the change in the gravitational field is so strong that they end up where they have one side that always faces the star. So they have a permanent day side and a permanent night side. This is similar to, this is the exact same thing, not similar, I mean, it's really the same thing with our moon. We always see the same side of the moon. You know, you heard the phrase, the dark side of the moon. Well, that, there's really not a dark side of the moon, but there's the other side of the moon, which is the side that we never ever see from Earth. These close-in planets have the same thing, where they have one side that's always the day side. So you have, so you can measure the day side temperature, the night side temperature, um, which is, you know, so here's kind of an example of it. If this, is the, if this is the flux, think of this as the amount of heat that we're seeing, the amount of radiation from the system, right? We're seeing the hot side of the planet. We're seeing more of the hot side of the planet, so this goes up. Then when the planet disappears, that's the amount of heat that the planet contributes. And then we see more of the cold side, and it kind of comes back down. So this little dip right here tells you how hot the planet is, and the shape of this curve will tell you how the heat is kind of divided up between day side and night side. And what I do is I use things like that, to actually kind of make maps of the planetary temperatures. Whereas, you know, this hot spot is here, you know, it's offset from the substellar point. It's kind of because winds are driving it that way. Uh, so just by looking at the shape of that phase curve that I just showed you, I kind of get this information about how the temperatures are distributed around the planet. If I know where the temperature, how the temperatures are distributed, that means I also know a lot about the winds that are driving those temperature distributions on the planet. So without ever actually having seen one of these things, we now have a ton of information about what they're made of from that chemical composition stuff. We know what their temperatures are like, and we know what their wind dynamics are like. So we can learn a lot without ever actually laying, you know, directly laying eyes on one of these things. And so to go back, tie this all up, potentially habitable planets, well, I said it's really hard to find habitable planets around sun-like stars, but there's these things called red dwarfs or M-dwarf stars that are like the size of Jupiter. And so they're much, much, much cooler. And if they're much cooler, that means that their habitable zone, their Goldilocks zone, if you will, the, this area where the temperature is just right, okay, for a sun-like star, you know, it's out here, roughly at Earth's orbit. That's where, that's where it's not too cold, not too hot, not too cold, it's just right. If you take a star that's really much cooler and much smaller, the habitable zone now becomes way down, way down in here, way, well inside the orbit of Mercury, which means that the habitable zone planets run orbits of just a few days. And these are easy for us to study because they transit all the time, over and over again, every couple days. If you wanted to study Earth, an Earth-like planet transiting, you'd only get one observation every 365 days. We can get one of these every week. So these are interesting systems to study. This is one called the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is the most promising one that we've found uh, just a handful of years. Has it been a handful now, four years ago maybe? Seven planets that we all, that we, uh, based on our mass estimates, all seem to be somewhat rocky in, in, in density. Uh, Earth's you know, very similar to Earth radius. And with three potential candidates here that could be in that Goldilocks zone, where temperature is gonna be just right. So these are gonna be intensely studied over the next five years or so uh, to see if in fact these do have atmospheres uh, and if those atmospheres are, you know, you know, what the temperature distributions are like, do they have atmospheres? Is there any chance that these could be, you know, life harboring or habitable type planets? So, um, so that's my, yeah, so there's my, you know, quick spiel on what I do in exoplanet science. Thank you, that's really fascinating. Um, so I think that it's about an hour. So um, I hope everybody has enjoyed this. I want to thank Brian Kilpatrick for joining us this evening virtually. Um, I hope everybody can go out and take what we've learned tonight and hopefully see some of the meteor showers over the next few days. Um, but thank you everyone to, for joining us. Thank you for supporting the Nature Conservancy. And uh, thank you to Brian. This was a really, really wonderful program. Have a great yeah, night, thanks. everyone. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.